Dr. Lingnao, please. Thank you so much, um, Alessandro. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, it is my real pleasure, a real pleasure, to, to be able to, um, to have this side event today um, and to, to thank you for what has been achieved over a couple of years. Um, Alessandro Meschinelli, representing uh, GIFA a long time before I was happy to join uh, a couple of months ago, and many of you, and let me just name um, Mr. Professor Syed Azam Ali, who is with us and who will join me in the introductory uh, remarks in a minute or two. Uh, let me also mention uh, Bioversity, represented by Dr. Carlo Fada, and um, many other and the main um, people and bodies and structures in, in this joint endeavor or in this collective action, as we call it in GIFAR. Uh, being the regional and the national um, partners in this collective action. You'll hear more about that, but I am free to praise you because I didn't contribute. I'm just um, amazed by what has been achieved over a very short uh, period of time, bringing all these constituencies, all these uh, uh, different um, organization and people from across the globe together to join in what is um, now a movement if I may say so. Um, and to, to give those of us who are uh, new to it, like I am, uh, a, a bit of a history of how we managed to come here. And then I'll turn over to first to Professor Saya to give us a bit of the, the spirit behind. He was at the very origin uh, of this uh, collective action and can, is best positioned to tell us about that. But then listen to the, to the regional representatives that we are happy to have with us tonight. Uh, how they look at it, what they expect from it, and how they want to take it uh, further. And uh, Carlo will be so kind to, uh, to present the action plan. So give me a couple of minutes to, to, to talk you through the history of how we came here. Um, so it all started uh, in a couple of years ago, 2017, when, uh, if I understand correctly, because I wasn't there, uh, the, the, the people I just mentioned, or the organizations I just mentioned, so mainly Crop of the Futures taking the lead, GFAR and its members, its regional members, uh, coming together and uh, starting working on collective, on this collective action of on forgotten foods. Uh, the whole purpose was to, to, to focus on farmers and on the very, um, too much overlooked forgotten foods that are also known as poor people food and that matter to family farmers and small scale producers all over the world. They are different for like forgotten foods, different uh, um, crops that are overlooked and un underutilized. Uh, but this is a common understanding that uh, all of you uh, share. Uh, after a while, the Secretariat came up with, uh, and many thanks again to Alessandro, who is also so kind to facilitate our meeting tonight, um, put together a, a draft of what we share, um, uh, what concerns we have, what perspectives we see uh, while addressing this agenda of forgotten foods um, in, uh, in, in, in as a collective action. So there was a, a, a draft manifesto that was shared with the regional networks for consultations, for discussions and consultations. And what came out of that, if I understand correctly, is that all of you agreed in order to address these challenges, farmers need to be the agents of change. So it's not about collective uh, or forgotten food per se. It's really about empowering the people who are interested and able to take this further. With this understanding, um, a whole range of uh, consult in-depth consultations with um, hundreds of partners uh, started uh, and partners now also involving farmers themselves. So following the, what I was just saying, they need to be center place, you put them center place. Um, this in the end, um, evolved into regional manifestos. Um, and then uh, GFAR came in again, happy to support uh, the, uh, the, and turning these regional manifestos into a global manifesto. The, the global manifesto uh, was again, or the draft was again consulted um, in, uh, and, and turned into a framework of shared values, principles, 
and strategy. And with this, and we launched it, you may remember, in, at the science days uh, that were part of the UN Food System Pre-Summit in uh, July this year. Um, and it serves as a framework uh, of uh, our common understanding as a, as a platform for pro-poor research and, um, and innovation. Um, and we now hope that this is going to be uh, not only a manifesto, but turned into action. And in order to do that, we have not been lazy since uh, July, but uh, all of you or many of you have contributed to turn it into, uh, to, to bring together communities of practice and to turn this into a global plan of action. So the, the, there are plenty of uh, individual initiatives and we will have an opportunity to speak further about that at the very end of today's meeting that uh, will be taken to potential funders and we stand ready to help you uh, with this. Um, but not just us, but as I said, it's a joint venture and at the global level, it's the GFA secretariat, it's uh, Crop for the Futures, is uh, the biodiversity, all of us with us uh, here tonight. To, uh, to take it further, to help you implementing uh, what has been put together in this ambitious and impressive plan of action. Carlo Fada will present it in a minute, but let's, first of all, to conclude the history, I have been taking you through with the philosophy that evolved um, during these years to Professor Syed Azam Ali. Syed, over to you, please. Thank you, Hildegard, and, and, and let me thank all of, all of you because uh, Hildegard mentioned this was a movement, and I agree, but it's also a journey, and it's been a long journey for many of us, and we've been involved with it in various stages of this journey, but everybody in this room, everybody virtually and, and collectively here believes in what we're trying to achieve, which is a real transformation of the, of the agri-food system. So, Nothing is going to be done quickly, and we know that the journey is a long one, but it won't work without a plan. And I just want to pick up on some of the issues in which the discussion and the engagement and the global nature of our engagement has led to an action plan. And, and the purpose of the global action plan is really to facilitate the wider adoption of forgotten foods and indeed the crops that uh, those, those foods derive from, and to improve nutrition, food security, support livelihoods, particularly of smallholder farmers, uh, rural women, and vulnerable communities. And we passionately believe that to do this, we have to di diversify beyond the narrow cohort, cohort of uh, staple crops on which we now depend. Indeed, four crops now provide more than 60% of the calories in the human diet, and four languages, written languages, store most of the knowledge on those four crops. This is not a basis on which we can actually achieve nutritional security for 10 billion people on a hotter planet and therefore we really believe that diversification is not a, a nice thing to do it's a critical need if we are to actually achieve not just our own wish for nutritional security but the sustainable development goals and of course the target of 1.5 degrees which we're very conscious of in terms of uh, the discussions going on recently at COP26. Now to do that, of course, we have to diversify, but I think we also have to reconsider the research model on which this global plan is based. And it won't be the same as the plan that we may have achieved for major crops because it's simply a different way of doing research that has to support this diversification. And to do that, we have an opportunity to demonstrate a model of research and innovation that puts farmers at the center of innovation and as the agents of their own change. And for this, we need to really provide support, formal research and expertise and our supporting tools, not top-down or, or linear ways in which we actually transfer technologies to communities, but indeed farmers and communities that protected these forgotten foods and the crops from which they derive are themselves the experts. We are not the experts in these crops, they are, we need to facilitate the technologies that can support that expertise and allow them to be the agents of change. Now to do that, and I think this is important for all of us, we really need to take off our institutional affi affiliations, our hats, our qualifications, our titles, and just sit down and say, what are the expertise, what are the skill sets we have that can contribute to this global plan of action? And if we can do that, we will make much faster progress as we move together 
than as individuals. And I think really looking at it in terms of our skills that we can offer as support for farmer-led innovation is actually critical to this global plan of action. It may indeed be a model for other research that goes beyond the, the Forgotten Foods Manifesto. So I, I really want to finish by just saying we can't do things in the way that have been done if we're to actually make this global plan successful. And the context of all of this is that the food system sits at the heart of the climate and the nutrition crises, the food system. And indeed, food system has not been recognized in terms of the climate change agenda as being critical to those issues of population growth, uh, dietary health, and of course, uh, uh, food security in a, in, a, in a hotter climate. So I think our purpose here is to provide the initiative and to equip those who are most vulnerable and least responsible for climate change. Those are the ones, those are the agents of change that will have to facilitate the, the systems in which they will have to be uh, the leaders because it's them who are on the front line of climate change. So in that sense, the challenge we have is not how we do it, but to motivate ourselves to provide the mechanisms for how they do it. And therefore farmers at the center of innovation in which we are the supporters and facilitators rather than the directors. And therefore research has to take a very different direction if we're to achieve this very challenging, but I believe totally essential uh, objective if we're to actually sustain uh, humanity on a hotter planet and a, and, 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 a, and, and a healthier society. Thank you, Hildegard. Thanks a lot, um, Sayed. Thank you, Hildegard, for walking us through both the history and the philosophy and the transformational uh, dimension of uh, what we've been doing so far and what we are actually doing. Now we'll get more into the heart of the matter with the presentation by Dr. Carlo Fadda of uh, the Alliance of Biodiversity and SIAT, uh, which will tell us about the global plan of action, its uh, collocation, its place uh, in the broader landscape of agrobiodiversity initiatives. Uh, since we are actually, uh, as I rem remembered at the beginning, a side event of the Agrobiodiversity Congress. So Carlo, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Alessandro. I don't have a presentation because I feel that uh, the, I mean, it's, it's really, my task here is really to present the action plan. And, and, and maybe, to, yeah, as you said, to put it uh, a little bit more in the context of, of, the, of, of the discussion that is taking place in the, in the agenda of, in the global agenda. I think there is, uh, when you look at what happened this year, it's, it's, it's really something that has changed, in my view, the perception of the uh, agrobiodiversity. Uh, first, in uh, the pre-food system summit, and Hildegard reminded me, there was a lot of emphasis on, on agrobiodiversity. Agrobiodiversity in the UN food system summit was a game changer. A lot of emphasis on uh, informal seed system as well, and, uh, and 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 that was one one really one very important and significant event in which uh, global policies are shaped, uh, where agrobiodiversity and forgotten foods were featured high, and then came uh, uh, the discussion, which is still ongoing, on the uh, agrobio on the. Um, post-biodiversity framework, 2030 post-biodiversity framework. The, the CBD and the biodiversity framework has always been pretty much about conserving wild diversity with very, very little emphasis on, on food system. And this year, this has changed with the, with the conversation around the post-2030 uh, biodiversity framework, uh, which is basically the new um, Aichi, Aichi targets, there has been a significant consideration of how food systems affect biodiversity. And as part of it, uh, agrobiodiversity has been given a much prominent role. And similarly, uh, in the COP26, which has just ended, uh, there has been uh, a very significant uh, discussion and, and engagement on, for example, indigenous people 
and their capacity to develop and, and, and to manage sustainable, uh, sustainably uh, the environment and the system. So I think the times are mature for uh, this agenda and this manif the global manifesto to really become uh, operational and, and to be operationalized. Uh, the, the global plan of action was derived from uh, the global manifesto. So that was a highly consultative, uh, uh, highly consultative meeting in which uh, um, hundreds of stakeholders from Asia, Africa, and uh, uh, North Africa, uh, Eastern Europe uh, uh, were, were actually involved. And that includes research, farmers organizations, and, and they really put a, a very strong demand for putting at the center of, 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 of agricultural development the forgotten food uh, agenda. Now, for that to happen, it is really important, uh, and I agree with what has been said before, that the farmers become uh, at the center of this agenda for a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, those crops are forgotten or neglected or underutilized uh, for a reason. And the reason, uh, uh, and, 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 and that's because there is no research. We don't know much about them. We don't know how much they can contribute to uh, nutrition. We don't know how much uh, they, can, they can contribute to resilience, to adaptation, to mitigation. And and, and so this, um, and this knowledge, though, it's available in the form of traditional knowledge by the communities. So as Sayed uh, said earlier, it's really important that this, that knowledge is used alongside to newly developed scientific knowledge to uh, boost an agenda on forgotten food. And that is also transformational uh, in, many, in many other ways and for many other reasons, uh, because when you look at how the, the global system is shaped, it's really shaped uh, along global value chains for the very few crops uh, that uh, make our, uh, our lunch, dinner, and breakfast every day. And we know that uh, these are the five or nine, depending how you count them, that make up to 75% of the calories that we eat today. And, and so you need to create an economy around forgotten food. That was very clear from the manifesto. It's important that the forgotten food become agent of economic growth uh, for the local community. So, in, so the, the communities and the farmers and the indigenous people need to put at the center in two ways. One way by sharing the knowledge and use that knowledge to develop a new agenda and a new strategy, but also as agent for economic growth for the country in which they live. So, uh, and that requires, and that is another aspect of the manifesto that requires promote awareness. There is a lot of culture in which um, uh, those forgotten food are actually considered backward. Many people and particularly urban and peri-urban uh, want to eat more modern type of food, like the the Kentucky, the, 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 the like the, the modern food, and and so that uh, that culture needs also to to be changed if we want the, the action plan to be successful. Uh, we need to develop new curricula. It was mentioned before. It's it's a transformational agenda. So probably some of the knowledge is not yet available. At the end, it needs to be a partnership between an inno a new way of partnership and co-researching uh, with the different, uh, the different uh, stakeholders. So we need new curricula, new teaching, new approaches. And particularly, we need us as a scientist, I am a scientist myself, uh, as a scientist, we need to understand uh, how we can work in a more productive way with the indigenous people and the local communities. We need to make sure that these seeds are available, that the, that the planting material, the reproductive material, being it for uh, trees, crops, uh, animal breeds, etc., are available to the local communities. There is one thing that is really important, and, and, and if you want these uh, crops to 
contribute to also to food security and the, and the adoption, the broader adoption of forgotten food is not detrimental to food security, it's important that the quality of the seeds is, is good. And we need to use a lot of the research uh, approach, for example, for improving uh, the productivity of those crops so that slowly by slowly they can, they can, that they can also enhance the contribution uh, to food security, not only to nutrition. So seed systems, seed system become a very important part of the action plan. We need to understand how we can strengthen what they are called the informal seed system and how we can probably actually eliminate the dichotomy between formal and informal, which for the farmers doesn't exist. If we want to understand uh, the world of the farmers, we need to, uh, to think that farmers may get uh, uh, hybrid maize from uh, agro shops and then they can get the vegetables or the beans uh, from, from the informal system. So for the farmers, this distinction is quite artificial. So, but how can we create seed system that provide high quality seeds for all the crops that the farmers want and not only for the few crops that are promoted by, by the formal part. We need to, uh, as part of the action plan, we need to support to shift public fundings. We need to, because it's not only about the adoption of forgotten food, but it's also about uh, the practices, no? the overall practices, the way soils are managed, the way water is managed, uh, that, that, that matters. So we, and, and, and the indigenous community manage this in a much more integrated way. So we really need to make sure that this diversification that was mentioned before by Sayed is accompanied by sustainable practices as well. Uh, and, and that requires, uh, partnership between, it, it requires uh, a collective action, which is the core of, of what GFAR does. So it requires that we all come together, that we document, that we continue uh, the push on, on, on this agenda through, for example, South-South or South-North net Network, so that the, the knowledge can be shared whenever we have a success story on how uh, forgotten foods are contributing to improving livelihood, resilience, nutrition, uh, actually this is shared and that we have a repository of that knowledge. Uh, and, and, and so we can, we can better uh, lobby uh, for this agenda to be, uh, to be mentioned. I already mentioned the importance of the markets and the supply chain, but COVID-19 taught us that this global value chain uh, may not work for, for local food systems. So we need to think shorter supply chains where the farmers can have a better role, maybe even using modern technology uh, to promote their products like simply WhatsApp uh, shops. Uh, I mentioned uh, about the, 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 the improvement that is still necessary and this is where the science can play a better role, but also it's important that all this is linked to to the gene banks. There is a lot of material that is conserved in national and international gene bank, which could provide quick, quickly uh, diversity that may be needed for increasing the resilience. Obviously, the, the, the action plan uh, is, is there to support partners in mobilizing more and better targeted investment for uh, research, innovation, technologies, infrastructure, infrastructure that will uh, uh, promote and support the for content food. Uh, we need to support countries in the action plan in defining their own pathway. This is very much context specific. So it's important that uh, countries can uh, uh, really make up their own mind about what is needed to, 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 to make the country uh, food secure, but also nutritional secure and also sustainable. So we need to uh, really work so that those agenda can be defined uh, can be defined by the country depending on, on, on their own resources and on their own uh, uh, priorities. And of course, strengthening capacity that is necessary uh, at all level, uh, and as I mentioned, and, uh, and, and so that, that becomes not only about the curricula, but really about uh, making, uh, about building the capacity of all stakeholders including the farmers, for example, to produce better quality seeds, et cetera, and, and, being, and, and being more uh, supporting, supportive of rural entrepreneurship, a little bit more of business mind. So th these are the key uh, elements of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the action plan. 
uh, to recap is really support through a platform, uh, have, a, have a place where uh, the information can be generated, shared, uh, curricula could be developed uh, it's, uh, and, and it could become a global lobbying for, for the agenda, support to countries, establish networks, support and, and promote access to markets and so awareness, uh, join work together on improving uh, whenever it's necessary uh, the, the forgotten foods or the genetic diversity, uh, help in, in mobilizing resources and help countries to define their own strategy if they if they need so and then strengthen the capacity. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Carlo, thank you very much for giving us uh, an overview of the plan of action and also its connection uh, with, the, uh, with the Congress and with the agrobiodiversity agenda. Uh, we will now uh, go uh, to you listen to the voices of the makers of both the manifesto and, uh, and the plan of action. And uh, we will hear from them how they see its implementation, how they see in their own region uh, what could be actually done. So we will really turn now to a very practical perspective, uh, reminding again, as I said, that the plan of action is the product of the regional networks that came together and were, and were coordinated uh, in their work by, by, by GFAR, by Crops for the Future, and by uh, Biodiversity and, and SEAT. So I'll pass on the floor to the Association of Agricultural Research Institutions in the Near East and North Africa, Arinena. And uh, please, Dr. Abdel Rahim, you have the floor and you can tell us about your perspective on the plan of action. I don't know if Dr. Abdel Rahim is with us now or not, because he if he's not, then, uh, then you please go ahead. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much. At the beginning, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, side event and led by GFR and both, all the people who are really making a great effort in this direction. So if you let me to share the screen, please. Okay, is that clear? Yes. Okay, uh, well, uh, at the Arenina, I will be talking about the collective action on forgotten foods concepts of plan of action. And this is a regional uh, perspective from the side of uh, Arenina. So uh, I'm sure every one of you knows about the Arenina and its establishment and the uh, vision of Arenina actually, it really, goes with the uh, what we are doing in uh, forgotten food. It's part of what we are doing because Arinina strive uh, to jointly strengthen and transform agriculture research and innovation to effectively and efficiently address the challenges. Uh, and we are working for sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous future for uh, the region. So uh, the mission of Arinina also, uh, it's in the same manner. So uh, I will go. Uh, to forgotten foods and actually the significance of forgotten foods, especially for regions like the uh, Nina region, where actually uh, we have a huge number of small farmers. It's a place where really we can benefit from uh, getting the uh, all uh, benefits from the forgotten foods and the neglected uh, species. So we are in an area with a lot of challenges, including climate change, food insecurity, imbalanced diets, undernourishment, uh, poverty, lack of empowerment of women and youth, and minimum or no support to small scale farming sector. And currently also the uh, Corona or the COVID-19 pandemic, which is really a, a big issue for the time being. So in the Nina region, actually, uh, it's known for its rich and valuable agrobiodiversity with the many species originated in this area. And the region is a center of diversity for a number of globally important crops, uh, crop plants, cereals, legumes, vegetable, fruit trees, forages. Uh, so actually uh, this region is a rich area in the essence of uh, agrobiodiversity. 
So uh, wild relatives of cultivated plants are threatened by the expansion of agricultural activity to marginal areas and to forest uh, remnants, as well as by overgrazing and urbanization. And this is a area where really conservation of biodiversity is a hot issue. So in the Lena region, actually, uh, it's a endowed with uh, wealth of neglected and underutilized species and traditional knowledge. Uh, but for the time being, we start to lose part of this because we are moving ahead actually with the number of the plants people are now getting to use and they are uh, forgetting the uh, other crops or the other wild relatives that used to be part of their uh, food. So the region is also known for its large number of underutilized important plants. Uh, so this is actually what we are facing at this time. And many of those plants, they are well known for their nutritional or medicinal values. And some of them, uh, they are really a rich medicinal uh, plants where people used to use for long period of time in their uh, medications. So the region is actually uh, suffered and still suffering from severe and long term droughts also at the same time. This year so far, many parts of the region is really still suffering the lack of rain. And uh, at this for, so, so that really uh, getting a problem for the uh, production of the crops. And uh, so uh, at the same time, also we have a problem with what's so-called obesity in uh, the cities and uh, the imbalance between the distribution of the uh, food and the prices also in uh, the, this region. So uh, if we look at this, we have, have to look to the uh, these crops from nutritive value, part of the uh, food of the people, and how really we can really work for getting back them to the food of the people. And in some cases, people are considering them for medication, especially uh, some of the problems now we have in the region, the cancer actually in the region now, is, the incidence is becoming high and the, the, if you look at the statistics, this is a uh, something which we have to really look at the area in this essence. So uh, we at Arenina actually, uh, we are really trying now to cope up with the uh, manifesto, with the plan of action in order to do our work. So from the uh, beginning, we formulated a technical committee for the uh, forgotten food and neglected species. At the same time, we start at the uh, Arenina to work closely with the people in those areas. Uh, and that's what we uh, have done so far. Let me uh, go now to the uh, key elements that are more relevant to the Nina region as sponsored by the uh, COP to advance the agenda. At the short term elements, we really uh, have to work for the development of comprehensive uh, inventories. And this is what we have started to work with the technical committee is really to work for a comprehensive inventory for the forgotten food and the neglected species. And that's not only include the plants because I see the focus now is on plants, but actually we are working on animals and on fisheries as well, because these are part also of the uh, food in the region. Uh, another thing is to have a comprehensive forgotten food awareness uh, rising strategy. At the same time, support of the ex situ and in situ conservation of those uh, threatened or uh, endangered species. And that's under the different categories of conservation, seed banking or uh, field, field conservation or nurseries, or even we have start talking about the based gene banking in the region. Uh, also the real knowledge and information sharing mechanism and establishing of networks and platforms. And actually in Arenina, we have already established a forgotten food and neglected species uh, network. And now we are meeting almost uh, every month discussing different issues of forgetting food and how can we cope up with the plan of action uh, under this uh, call. Uh, the other one is the medium and long-term elements. We are, uh, we discussed actually 
the participatory, participatory holistic value chain approach in this uh, case. And uh, we are looking about the different aspects involved in this uh, direction. Also the knowledge, practices and interests of smallholder farmers, particularly if we are focusing women, youth and indigenous people and local communities because the knowledge is existed among the indigenous people about the utilization, the use, and sometimes even the medicinal uses of some of these plants or some of those uh, neglected uh, species. Support short supply chain and market need assessment uh, studies. And this is really very important uh, issue. And I think we have to work in this direction because this is one of the part where we have to focus a little bit, especially if we are talking about the smallholder farmers. Development of uh, policy briefs uh, in this case. So we have to promote forgetting foods, but how can we promote that? We have to have incentives. We have to go for the regulations. We have to the protection of rights, etc. in this uh, case. A stakeholders capacity development framework for enhancing functional and institutional and organizational capacities. And that's even when uh, mentioned about the curriculum and mentioned about this thing. I think now we have to support graduate students to be involved with studies, with the projects, with different aspects in this direction. And we might even support a master program in some of the universities or the research institutions in order to get more people and build capacities in this uh, direction. So the key priorities, actually, as I mentioned, the inventory status of conservation, characterization, and utilization. So this is one of the key priorities. Collection, conservation, and characterization. This is another priority, which we discussed actually in our technical committee. Effective awareness raising process, documentation, and knowledge management, because actually, if you go to the average person or to the communities, there is not that much awareness about this. And at the same time, you are getting the modern foods getting all the time, you have more production, they are available. And at the same time, we are getting for maybe five to nine uh, different plants. They are making most of our food rather than to really have uh, the knowledge and people aware of those uh, food, those food or species. Establishment of smart novel research network that will be upgraded to a platform. And actually a platform uh, is a need at this time. And it's a priority to have a platform. Maybe, uh, I don't think a platform at one region is good, but I think we have to have maybe a wider platform in order to get people to interact and to get the information and the knowledge from in this uh, direction. Target capacity development, uh, actually for the communities, for about marketing, about doing all of this work, because even if you go for these species and, and you produce them still marketing, still uh, how to get them to the value chain, how to get them in that direction, this is still something we have to work on it. Also uh, advocacy and evidence-based policy, uh, in this direction, this is one priority we have to uh, really uh, care about it. So, uh, as I said, uh, at the level of incentives in this direction, also we have to go for the conservation issues. We have to uh, middle in the marketing uh, of those uh, forgotten food and neglected species in order to get them in the right direction. So the same thing, uh, conservation, uh, ex situ and in situ conservation, conservation is really an important. Also access to markets, which is very important because in many agrobiodiversity projects, people have produced and by the end, marketing was a major problem. And this is why I think we have to consider marketing from the very beginning and we have to work for the marketing in order to really get a good supply chain, good marketing, good value added from those uh, products. Funding mechanism and sustainable investment. If there is no fund for this work, I think we it's hard for us to do it. Uh, I, I will go pretty fast in this progress so far. Uh, in this case, actually we have to, uh, we are progressed in the collective action. Uh, we are, uh, also uh, establish the network. And I think we are going to 
really wide our network. Now we have 27 countries, uh, institutions, members with us in this network, but also we are working to increase the size of the network. A standard inventory spreadsheet, we have prepared it now and we are getting the data from uh, other countries in the NINA region. Uh, data knowledge collection from question, uh, form questionnaire, we have developed the form and now uh, we approved it in our last meeting and we will start to send this questionnaire to our members in every country in order to start collecting data in this direction because the data is needed for us. Also, Arenina, Arenina actually uh, is still actively participating in the development of the global collective action on forgotten food. Dr. Adil usually with this group in the previous meetings and uh, we are really backing him up in uh, all of our meetings so every other week we have a meeting uh, considering the forgotten food. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't take a long time. No, not at all. No, no. Thank you very much. Uh, we will still see your uh, your PowerPoint on the screen. Okay, I will stop sharing. Thank thanks you. Thank you very much. So th thanks a lot for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. And uh, while we are waiting uh, for Dr. Fatumi from Farah to connect, I think there was a problem uh, to find a link. Uh, we might uh, uh, listen directly now to Dr. Ketapal Ravi, please, <clears throat> from APARI, the, uh, the Executive Secretary of Asia Pacific Association of Agricultural Research Institutions. Ravi, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Ravi, uh, I think you're muted. Ravi, I think you need to unmute, unmute yourself because we can't hear you. Ravi? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Really sorry for that. It's okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank organizers of uh, International Agrobiodiversity Congress for really giving the space to GFAR for organizing this side event. Then I would like to thank GFAR, which has played a very important role in bringing this subject topic to the limelight. It is not the topic of collection, collective action on forgotten food only, but the very concept of collective action. It's a time where people are working in silos, they are working independently, they have their own way. At this juncture, when we see uh, people have come on the common platform to work collectively with the support of GFAR, it's a great thing which has happened. And I'm, I'm sure with that, we'll achieve the objectives as much as we all can. Now, having said that, uh, let me enlarge my PowerPoint. I will give a brief glimpse of what APARI is, uh, which had taken up this task. Well, the very vision of APARI in Asia Pacific is strengthening agri-food research and innovations for sustainable agriculture development. So research and innovation is at the core of APARI activities. And we do it with a clear strategic plan where we have four thematic areas, natural resource management, risk mitigation, inclusive development, policy and advocacy. So the topic of uh, forgotten food falls under natural resource management and under inclusive development, and also to some extent under policy and advocacy. We have more than 80 members of Asia and Pacific and they are the National Agriculture Research and Extension System members, international research organizations, which include all the CGIR and ELCA institutes, higher education sector, sub-regional bodies, and some associations, foundations, and now even the private sector. So uh, with this brief background on APARI, I will just come to the topic of the day. Uh, why might, yes. Uh, 
if you look at why forgotten foods in Asia Pacific, and we all know, in fact, what I'm going to say is applicable for the global level, at the global level. This is because of the ex excessive focus we had on the staple crops. This is because many crops were forgotten by the formal research system, and hence they drifted away from value and supply chains. And this is because of the agricultural innovations and technology, which had a limited adoption by farmers and end users. Also the lack of focus on co-learning and co-innovation co system. So these were the points which we felt when we got the offer or the request from GFAR to participate, we felt this is something very, very important for Asia and Pacific. And we also felt that uh, why we should not participate. Looking at the demography of Asia Pacific, you see here the bar diagram on the right, Asia represents 60% of the world population. So if we have achieved something, it means we have achieved for 60% of the world, which is for more than 4 billion people. So there's a lot of exercise to be done, but yes, I think we need to really focus on it. Then the diversity of Asia Pacific, I think there is no match in all terms, cultural, agricultural, ethnic, tribal, whatever way you take. And also diversity of economies. We have the most developed countries like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and all. We have the developing countries like India, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. And we also have some least developed countries. So we, we have all kinds of diversity one can imagine. And we have abundant local and indigenous knowledge of farmers. So with the farmers and other innovation actors in the region, we realize we need to change the local, the existing research system and value chain. Having said that, with uh, I must say here, I uh, appreciate the moderator Alexander, uh, who actually contacted us last December, but we came into an agreement in February this year. It's in a span of four months, it has never happened in a project for us. Within four months, with the basic uh, concept or draft given by uh, Carlo and Sayed, who were the brains behind the whole thing, who were leading the show for GFAR, we developed our regional manifesto as did Farah and Arinina. And this was a very intensive exercise. I want everyone to know the value of the work done at the regional level. We had online survey, we had a, almost a weekly online meetings, some face-to-face -face meetings, mini workshops, and finally a regional webinar with multi-stakeholder participation. The most important point was the partners with whom we worked. Most important was Asia Farmer Association, who is a member of APARI also, followed by uh, we had uh, ICRISAC with the, as an international uh, CG organization so far. I'm sure in January they're going to be independent. Uh, then we had a very leading NGO, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. And so also we had one or a women organization of NGO called Barley. And we all combined with other stakeholders, with my party colleagues and with the regular interaction with Alexandro, with Sayed, with Carlo. I think we, we really debated, not only discussed, we came to some good conclusions and we contributed the regional manifesto uh, in the month of June. And based on that, very quickly, it, at the convergence of the three regional manifesto and community of practice and all, we had a global manifesto, which Carlo had briefed in the initial uh, session. Now, this global manifesto allowed us to the community of practice, which was global, to have a global plan of action, which has come up now. And it was showcased, uh, the manifesto was showcased also in the United Nations Food System Summit uh, in the month of September. Uh, some highlights of our regional manifesto. 
we, you can see the depth of involvement from here, which means what has come in Global Manifesto has a sense, has some gravity. Um, about 250 participants represented, represented 38 countries from 160 institutions, mainly from Asia and some beyond Asia. During the regional webinar, we had a very good panel discussion and presentations and all. Uh, I was trying to note down some of the key points which was turning the whole game. The first, I'm going to highlight that. I mean, this is very important to know. The first point is, this is not a manifesto for the archives. This statement was made by Alexander himself. He might have forgotten, I'm sure. He will not remember. He has so many things in his head. Then second statement, this highlighted the, the viability and the, you know, like the, the way it is going to be something which is going to be in action. Then food diversification is required to ensure climate resilient nutrition. This was a very important point, which is at the core of the manifesto, highlighted by Syed, who gave a initial remarks with Hildegard. This, these are the points which I really picked up and the farmers are the custodian of genetic resources. Highlighted from the best Papua New Guinea from uh, National Agriculture Research Institute, uh, Deputy Director General uh, Bharti Kamalon. Very important point because we know nowadays farmers are fighting for their own kind of intellectual property right because they have been the custodian over ages. These are the points we need to factor when we move ahead. Then the point made by a farmer, but by uh, Asian Farmers Association in the meeting, inclusion of traditional food in all public food system will provide region specific opportunities and demand for traditional crops. So this represents a different dimension of how we can change the uh, consumer's preference and bring them back to the traditional food to forgotten food and make it more popular. So the, these, some of the statements, the key statements which I highlighted were very crucial for us to get motivated to work further on this. And when we prepared our manifesto after the, uh, I think I'm missing one PowerPoint here. Anyway, yeah, so we, we we prepared from the angle of the transformation of research system to innovation, active engagement of farmers, the technical areas that need to be highlighted, the awareness building, the advocacy, and the need for a knowledge platform. Now, when we look at this global manifesto, we are very happy to see most of the points are very well embedded there, though it is better packaged and it is more global. Uh, Immediate action, as we have highlighted in the Global Manifesto, which is highly relevant for us in Asia, awareness raising. Awareness raising actually means reaching to the civil society more, not only to the policymakers and scientists and all. Why we are saying that? Because we need this movement and we need a mass awareness of it. A lot of work is going on in Asia Pacific on the underutilized species or the forgotten food or neglected, underutilized species, whichever way we may call it, but they are all, again, very fragmented. We don't have uh, much of a cohesive, comprehensive document to say this is where we are in the region. Then a uh, very important point to the knowledge platform we need to do here is integrating scientific and community knowledge. Another point which we have integrated in all the projects and programs of APARI because we have taken innovation at the core of APARI functioning. And in all the capacity development programs now, we are making efforts to blend technical capacity with the functional skills or the functional capacity, what we call soft skills in the common man's language. And these functional skills, we have a special module to really do training for that, where we blend with technical capacity, they are the capacities which help you to collaborate. They are the capacities which help you to do policy interventions. They are the capacities which help you to carry forward your activities in the most functional way. 
So that is completely a subject by itself, but there is a great need, uh, which we are already doing, but we will be ensuring that this becomes more popular with our partners in Asia and Pacific. And also the collaboration South, South and South North research platforms, the innovation platforms. I think those are the things we do have some platform right now, and we are erecting one uh, innovation platform in the region. We recently completed a joint rapid appraisal of innovation status in the Asia Pacific. So we will see how this finds a place there with time. And of the middle, medium and long-term actions in the global manifesto, we have a clear focus on making it not only farmer-centric, but farmer-driven and involving them to ensure that we have the market access and value chain well-defined. Definitely the need for looking at the XC2, like what uh, my friend from Ali Nina presented, and community seed banks, which are very crucial and which we have in many countries in, India, uh, in Asia. Advocacies and evidence-based policies. This is quite a challenging work, especially when it comes to policies. And about the education, Carlo has highlighted, we feel it has to be completely embedded in the education, educational curriculum. And we, we are working, uh, we have initiated working on linking innovations with education. We'll see how it finds a place there. And the most challenging investment in research and innovation, which will require our kind of uh, articulation how we highlight the importance, how we really perform with the donors. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Asia Pacific is not on track to achieve any sustainable development goals by 2030. We all use the word SDG so casually, and we all say we are contributing for SDG. The report from the United Nations Economic Social Commission for Asia Pacific made it very clear that we are not even a halfway the mark where we should have been till now. It's a big challenge and all of you know how COVID-19 has further aggravated the challenge for SDGs. In fact, the SDGs itself need a midterm corrections in terms of targets. But the point I want to highlight is through forgotten food, we can really help contribute in a modest way in the region towards this aspect. And the challenging problems of nutrition and the climate uh, impacts, which are going, which makes working food more important, is highly crucial for Asia and Pacific. Look at this map. Look at the colors from maroon to yellow. Maroon rep represents the highest level of vulnerability. Look at the countries in Asia Pacific. It is almost completely rank one. We don't want to be getting the first prize in this, but we got it. And Africa also, a part of Africa is also highly vulnerable, but Asia Pacific is the most vulnerable region in the globe. And that again highlights the importance of using those climate resilient crops like forgotten food, which would be, which should be the order of the day in the coming years. Now, uh, Looking at the key priorities and progress, or you may call it the way forward. Community of practice, a global has been formed. Regional, we have defined our community of practice. We have a number of partners who were associated with us. We identified some more. They are multi-stakeholder partners. And another point very important uh, is here is targeting on the ongoing relevant activities. We are not inventing the forgotten foods. We are not uh, like really going to do something very new. We, we really have to start by looking at the ongoing activities on underutilized species and on the neglected underutilized species to see that where the building up of the program may be easier in the region. This is what we are going to promote. And very important point is stakeholder mapping various kinds of stakeholders to get these stakeholders specific relevant projects. 
which will be done in the next community or practice meeting. If it is a farmer as a stakeholder, if it is a research organization as a stakeholder, it is a private sector, it is an international organization, it is an NGO. Every stakeholder will have its own kind of contribution in the comprehensive picture of what we want to achieve as a goal in the Global Manifesto. So these are crucial points for us, the priorities for us, how we go with the stakeholder mapping and the relevant projects. And then the most, most challenging is resource mobilization and communication strategies. I think this is a task where no one can do alone. Here, all the regions, not only Asia Pacific, has to take along with it GFAR and Alliance Biodiversity International, SIAD Alliance and Crop for Future. I think we all have to stand as one unit when we pitch our things to the donors to see that we get the right thing for each of the region. And communication strategy, of course, will be coming up, which will be very crucial, which will outline exactly how we are going to carry forward uh, in the coming years, the whole concept of forgotten food. Sorry, I'm not able to shift my PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. So the challenges, if I'm highlighting the challenges, doesn't mean we are running away. When we are highlighting the challenges in the region, that means these are the points we have to be very careful. We have to exert a bit more to work in the region. First challenge in the region in Asia Pacific is too many agencies, too many institutions, there are thousands and thousands, and there's a lot of diversity in economies, which will be a challenge to really design a comprehensive approach which will be a challenge in identifying the entry points. It has to be country specific, institution specific, and organization specific. And another challenge which often people face, but they don't project, is the political volatility. For Asia, I can say uh, very frankly, is most of the countries have a very volatile politics. Things change overnight, governments change overnight, policies change overnight. These are the things which are challenges which are beyond our control, but we need to keep in mind not to get discouraged is the point I'm highlighting here. This leads to resource crunch with the new people, new management, new policies in the countries, and this impact the investment in innovations. So these challenges we have to, in a very cryptic manner, we really need to be very smartly overcoming. And one of the challenge, the most difficult challenge is to overcome the egos of, or the mindset of scientists and policymakers in the region. I'm also a scientist by background, but this is a species which has the highest level of ego in the world. And they are not able to come out of the cocoon where they feel any impact factor of a publication is more important for their career then the impact of the work on the ground for the poor farmers. So here, these are the points which are very crucial and we will really have to work very hard here. But yes, within our team, within our community of practice and with the support of GFAR, Alliance Biodiversity, Crop for Future, I think we have the right kind of people in the group. We are committed to do our best. With this, I would like to end here my talk and thank you everyone. Thanks a lot, uh, Ravi, for this uh, presentation and for speaking so uh, in a, such an outspoken way about the challenges and uh, and the, also the difficulties that we have to face. But we we have we are a community, and that's that's that is our strength. And I think you highlighted this fact very well. I will now uh, pass on the floor to uh, the representative of FARA the Senior Innovation System Specialist, Olowe Fatumbi, to uh, present us the perspective of the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa 
on the implementation of the plan of action. Oluwe, you have the floor, please. Dr. Fatumi, are you, are you there? Um, yeah. Yeah, you're muted. I think you need to unmute yourself. Wally, can you hear me? Wally? There seems to be some uh, problem with the connection because... Wally? I think we lost for the moment Farah. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, we'll pass on to uh, the Asian Farmer Association. Irish Bagilat will uh, make her presentation and we'll have Farah uh, at the end. Wally? No, I write a mail to Wally to inform him about this. So, uh, Irish, are you ready to present? Uh, yes. Um, although so, I cannot show my uh, my screen yeah, because um, and because yeah. uh, the screen is occupied by yeah. Let's see if I can unblock this. So, so maybe the host can end the screen sharing. So I can um, share. Uh, let's see if we can do that. I think it should be Charles is indicated, Charles Plummer, who is indicated as the host. Yes, but I, I don't know if he's actually able to connect himself right now. He was oh. with us. Let's see whether he's still around. I can still see him. Let me send him a message. Okay, I think. Um... Okay, fine. Please, please go ahead, uh, Irish. Thank you very much so to present uh, farmers' perspective on uh, the implementation of the global plan of action. Yes. So again. Um... Good afternoon or good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, greetings from the Philippines. So as um, introduced, uh, my name is Irish with the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable uh, Rural Development, or APA, which is a, a regional alliance of uh, national farmers organization. Uh, at the moment, uh, 20, uh, we have 20 members uh, in 16 countries. And in total, um, the membership is around um, 13 uh, million. And uh, further, we work with other um, regional uh, organization, uh, CSOs and other farmers organization uh, uh, reaching um, other countries, even in the Pacific. So again, um, even though it's uh, wee hours of Friday here, uh, it's uh, a delight to take part um, in this uh, very important event to share uh, our uh, perspective and share um, what uh, we have done so far and what uh, we, we intend to, to do um, as a farmers organization and of course in partnership with our regional uh, partners uh, APARI and um, MSSRF. So um, 
yeah, uh, many uh, aspects of the um, action plan that's, that was uh, described by uh, Carlo earlier um, are much aligned with the express needs of uh, the farmers from the survey which we have undertaken as already mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Ravi. Uh, the survey, uh, we did it with MS Wominetan Research Foundation and other uh, 24 organizations, uh, as you can see their logo on in the screen. And we did it with uh, 3,087 farmers from March to uh, June of, of this year involving 19 countries. And um, I want to start um, uh, sharing this because uh, we thought that this process is uh, very, uh, very important, um, aside from it being a uh, very uh, symbolic starting from uh, what the farmers needs and what the farmer uh, farmers uh, wants. So out of the uh, out of the survey, uh, we have developed a farmers uh, declaration that have uh, that summarized um, our demands uh, to the government and to all development partners, to the research agencies, to the private sectors, to the NGOs. And um, this uh, dec declaration um, informed the Asia uh, Pacific Manifesto, which was also shared by Dr. Ravi, and in turn, it um, informed the global uh, manifesto, which was described also um, partially earlier. And um, the declaration has already been translated in national languages so that um, we can give it back to our constituency and our partners. And um, since the regional event that uh, we have had, um, I'm happy to, to inform our partners and everyone here um, in this um, Zoom uh, meeting that uh, the declaration and the, the data uh, that we gathered from the survey has been used by some of our partners to engage uh, research centers in their, um, in their countries. So, um, not only that, you know, not only that we have been using it at the regional level to to talk about the importance of process, the importance of uh, really engaging farmers um, and getting their their uh, feedback. Um, the 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 declaration um, served as a a tool to mobilize resources, to mobilize support from different uh, stakeholders. And, and as I have said, um, we are so happy uh, about uh, the process. Uh, we have seen it as uh, something uh, empowering. In fact, in the previous week, I have attended two, um, two events. And uh, one of the questions that were uh, given to us um, is, is to cite an example or an initiative uh, that we, we think uh, can be transformative. And um, uh, of course, um, I have uh, cited uh, this collective action as one of, of the example. While it's a long way, as mentioned earlier, while um, it's uh, ambitious and a long way, um, I think um, it's, uh, it's a good start. And as mentioned uh, last night by the CS CFS chair that just like you know, um, the, the term food system, it has not been discussed few years ago. But after three years, it's it's it has become you know uh, the word. So we 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 feel uh, it, it, we see the same thing for what we are doing uh, for on forgotten food on uh, the neglected underutilized species. Uh, species. Um, we have started it, and uh, we you know we uh, hopefully in the coming years uh, we will see. Um, a positive outcome. So going back to the action plan, um, it talked about um, inventory, crop improvements, uh, strengthening of seed systems. And uh, we, uh, as a regional organization, a regional farmers organization, we reinforce that. Uh, we reinforce the intention of the globe, uh, of that, um, of the uh, action plan of the manifesto that is to place the farmers, smallholder farmers at the center of research and innovation in, in the different areas. Uh, because we know that beyond a food production, family farmers, um, indigenous peoples, I myself from uh, the Ifugawa tribe in the Cordillera region in the Philippines, we are um, 
we are knowledge uh, holders and producers beyond the food that uh, we produce for our communities. And we continue to serve, as you uh, many of you have mentioned, um, custodians of agrobiodiversity and managers of uh, natural resources. So indeed, uh, co-creation of innovation, uh, most especially on forgotten food um, that will increase our income and resilience uh, is the way forward and is the way to go. So uh, not only at the center, but as you can see on my slide, we chose the word forefront. Farmers leading the research and innovation on forgotten food because we all know that for uh, for years decades it's the farmers who has been nurturing it's the indigenous peoples who has been nurturing um these crops using their own um own knowledge using uh the knowledge that has been uh, passed down from generation to generation so um so as we embark on the implementation of the manifesto and the uh, plan of action uh, we we want to see this um, this as the goal um, as a regional organization. The hopeful we hope that the activities that we will be undertaking in the next uh, few months will empower smallholder farmers and our organizations to govern, manage, sustain agrobiodiversity-based livelihoods, and of course. In, um, around forgotten foods. And we see that um, this has the potential to increase our resilience, uh, our economic situation, and um, thereby we contribute to uh, better nutrition, not just to our families, but also uh, to our uh, communities. So uh, we see uh, three areas where we can consolidate um, our activities um, in uh, in the next coming months and 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 years and uh, hopefully we can uh, of course uh, align all these with with other partners so we see uh, capacity development as one uh, important area capacity development to um, innovate uh, across the value chain from production processing and uh, marketing of forgotten food and um, as a regional organization, um, we are heavily involved in uh, policy advocacy. So we also see that as um, one thing that uh, we can do at the region um, and participate in program development. And of course, uh, very important is the awareness uh, building on the value of uh, forgotten food. So what can we do uh, at the national level? and also at the regional level uh, in terms of uh, specific activities. So at the national levels, we can always start where the farmers are and what the farmer organizations are already doing. So for example, our member in Bangladesh, um, they are already into seed business and they have already set up um, several or uh, many community uh, seed banks, but mostly on um, the major crops. However, um, they have also experimented on vegetables and indigenous crops, but they, they, they um, had uh, numerous challenges um, and had issues sustaining them. So, but uh, they have the, the capacity, they have the skills in terms of um, developing a seed system. So uh, it's there. Um, some farmers organization um, in various countries in Asia are already um, uh, doing what uh, we, we plan to do. And similarly, uh, our partner in Sri Lanka, as you can see in, in the screen, uh, they have empowered uh, women farmers through enterprise development around traditional food crops. So um, our partner, the Blanca Farmers Forum, um, they have been practicing agroecology, which um, of course enhances agrobiodiversity, protects the environment. Um, they have uh, used traditional seed varieties, uh, which, um, which uh, some of uh, you already uh, mentioned that they can uh, tolerate pest diseases and climate change uh, uh, effects. So the farmers have been a uh, value adding, um, and they have converting the, uh, they have converted them into um, food commodities to earn better income. And they have even uh, packaged them and um, also uh, brand, uh, put some branding on these uh, on their products. So uh, another um, example um, 
that uh, I wanted to, to share is uh, the work that uh, is being done by our member in India, um, SEWA, Self-Employed Women, Women's Association. So it, it's really a huge organization uh, with uh, around uh, more than a million uh, members. Uh, they they have they have uh, started a uh, food processing and they have used uh, their rural distribution network, which they call Rudy, to distribute this uh, processed uh, food. And they even have uh, also uh, started with the traditional crops uh, that they have, specifically the the millet. And also in the Pacific, uh, one of our uh, partner, um, they have been implementing the Pacific Bread, Fruit and Seeds program. And um, they were uh, very uh, successful in engaging um, the research uh, agencies and uh, support agencies to invest in the development of breadfruit. And on participatory research, our member in uh, Lao, the Lao Farmer Network, have also uh, were also um, involved in uh, many uh, participatory action uh, research, farmer-led farmer research. So all these things um, we can learn from and we can start from there. We can start from the lessons that has been learned. We can even start in some of these countries who already has uh, initial work uh, and uh, we can uh, we can further strengthen their work. So the next slides will just show you some of the uh, key activities uh, that we thought uh, we can we can do. So at the national level, um, of course, uh, identification of um, of uh, the country where we wanted to to start um, uh, implementing the uh, the plan of action. Uh, we started this process, so we had an internal discussion, uh, setting of criteria, um, again, starting from where there are already initiatives to build on. And then uh, we also see, of course, we need to, to start uh, with a, a particular crop. So uh, we can do, um, we can do um, uh, all the uh, capacity development, uh, we, we can do all the the uh, value chain um, activities. So we can do mapping, identification, prioritization of uh, varieties that the farmers want. Of course, it would be them uh, who, will, um, who will go through this process. And then capacity development for research and innovation, uh, it has to be done with uh, our uh, research partners. So uh, APARI has, um, has uh, members or partners also in countries where there, uh, there are AFA members. So uh, there are opportunities really to collaborate. And then um, we also see that um, uh, we, we can uh, work with um, research agencies to fine tune farmers uh, innovation or other existing innovations, uh, again, from production to, uh, to marketing. And then uh, awareness campaign, this came out in the uh, survey as one of the key, uh, key um, things uh, that need to be uh, done. And then, uh, of course, the market um, uh, challenges. So we need to do a business development and um, also um, identification of um, the, the right strategy to link to the market. Uh, we, we are doing this. Um, but in another uh, another context, but uh, it's very important. I wanted to uh, to to raise here that uh, we have um, strong farmers organization and we have strong uh, member uh, cooperatives that are really doing uh, doing very uh, well, and that's another criteria. Um, we can start working with uh, with uh, members who have uh, strong uh, cooperatives. And um, of course, uh, as uh, to sustain and to to help in the dif uh, diffusion and um, and scaling up, uh, we can uh, we can uh, form learning circles or knowledge networks at the national level, and uh, also policy advocacy. And at the regional level, we can do. Um, uh, several actions um, we, we can uh, as a regional organization we need also to um, strengthen our capacity for um, research and innovation uh, we can facilitate uh, exchanges uh, and we can do advocacy uh, with the regional uh, bodies as what we have been um, doing already 
And again, uh, we hope that all these will lead to the empowerment of smallholder farmers. I think um, if if um, we we if our partners, uh, the research uh, agencies, the government, and other development partners really invest in increasing the capacity of uh, farmers' organization, then it's it's a win-win um, for for everyone for the society. That ends uh, my presentation. Back to you, <clears throat> Alessandro. Irish, thank you very much for this presentation, and thank you for showing us, uh, which is also echoing something that Ravi was saying, that things are already there, that we don't need to reinvent, that we need just to uh, give more impetus to the dynamics that are already uh, on the ground. And you highlighted very much this through the, through the pictures that we saw of the women in particular at work on Forgotten Foods. So now we move on to Farah. We have to be very careful with the time because we want the debate to take place and we don't want, as usual, as in many webinars, to have all the time taken by the presenters. So, uh, Wally, thank you very much for getting back in spite of the technical problems. The floor is yours. If you could try to maintain your presentation within 15 minutes. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alexandro, and um, greetings to everyone. Apologies for the failure of internet on my system. Um, I will keep to, to time. I simply want to speak to the essentials of the African Manifesto on Forgotten Food and the progress we have made um, thus far. Well, these three questions are the ones I will respond to. Why forgotten food is important in Africa and uh, what are the strong elements of um, the global manifesto that Africa is already responding to and what are the key priorities. And I want to pick it from the first one, which is paramount. Why forgotten food is important in, in Africa. Of course, I, I think the scenario for food, food security and I mean food and nutritional security in, in Africa is, is what uh, across um, the globe. Um, about 1.2 billion people in, I mean, 20% of the 1.2 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa are undernourished. And the larger percentage of these undernourished people um, live in the rural areas. Largely, about 40.7% of the um, individuals in, in African countries are dwelling in the rural area. Well, the implication of food and nutritional security is very there in, in Africa. It, it affects the civil society, it affects the cognition of children, and it affects even the economy of the nation. And then you know that the first 2000 days of life is really very, very important. And so this situation also have the tendency to affect posterity. I mean, the well-being of the next generation of, of Africa. Now, um, someone made a statement which is very important to us in Africa. He said, if a, con a continent is suffering from um, scarcity of food or lack of adequate nutrition. How are we going to call some food forgotten or abandoned? Now, it is important for Africa to bring forth the food that are forgotten in the past. And I'm not going to spend time to be defining what forgotten food is. I anticipate that this audience understand it very well. Now, we need to reawaken these foods that are forgotten, and there are a lot of them. There is this catalog of 101 indigenous food commodities that are identified already. And it is discovered that this 101 indigenous food commodity, their nutrition is far higher than the conventional um, food items that are only dense in, in calories, but not rich in, in nutrients. These commodities are also better adapted to Africa climate and natural resource domain. So they re require um, less external impute to produce them. And this is important for Africa because some of the commodities that we grow now, I call them the egalitarian commodities used for food in Africa. Uh, we tend to face a lot of yield gap and we've been struggling with yield gap for decades. But if we had gone in the direction of these orphan crops, the forgotten food, then we will not have this problem. Paradventure will be able to produce sufficient food that feed the populace. I like to use this illustration 
to show that the center of origin for almost half of the forgotten foods across the globe is Africa. This is a research we conducted not too long ago. You will see that 46% of the abandoned food, they have their center of origin in Africa. And that suggests that Africa have a, we have huge potential to actually explore this and use it in the direction of our interest. I'm sure other speakers have spoken strongly about the process we use to develop the Continental Manifesto. And, and we give um, the due credit to, to GIFA for rallying around all the um, um, regional organization together to deliver this. Of course, we all work together in our different regions under uh, GIFA in, because we want to present the manifest, the global manifesto at the food summit. Now, looking at the global manifesto that we hold, we have worked together to present, there are um, ten, 10 key uh, points here. And I want to say that the African manifesto speaks strongly to these 10 points. So I will not spend too much time looking at each of these points. Rather, I will go to the process we use in developing the African manifesto. We, we started with developing a working paper. Um, we opened a deep group platform for interaction and we're able to engage a lot of Africans. So 500 um, individuals from different organizations participated. We organized a webinar with these individuals and we discussed thoroughly the subject of forgotten food in Africa. After this, we work with a critical mass to put together the African manifesto. And after that, we have moved on to develop a community of practice that is interacting on daily basis on this subject as new issues. I imagine Africans um, is, um, keep um, discussing it. There are five pillars in the, in the African Manifesto of Forgotten Foods. Of course, these five pillars are very important and I'm going to just mention them in person. Now, we, we discovered that we need to establish a dedicated and functional research and innovation system for the forgotten food. And this is really, really very important because we observe that the peculiarities of forgotten foods will not align with the current research system. The second one is that we need to incrementally build appropriate innovation capacities and infrastructure at different level in Africa if we will quickly bring the forgotten food into four, into the, 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 the front line within our food system. The third one is to establish appropriate partnerships and strategic alliance to foster, number one, the a, a very good engagement of different stakeholders in Africa, the youth, the women, and the um, others, especially, and also the policymakers. But also we are looking at intercontinental partnerships, possibly exploring the South-South, the North-South partnership. The fourth pillar is to facilitate the engagement of the private sector for investment into production, processing, marketing, of this forgotten food. This is also very important. And the last one is to create a regional pool of financial resources to support research and coherent development um, effort. Of course, you agree with me that we will not be able to do much without sufficient um, resources. So these are the pillars, but for these pillars, there are action plans. And these action plans are quite specific and I'm going to really give um, attention to them in this presentation. We realize that we need to start from creating awareness. And I, I, I love to say it every time that we have abandoned this food for more than four to six decades, 40 to 60 years. So the current generation, many of them did not know this food. In fact, most of these foods, we, we need to dig down into the indigenous knowledge and then, I mean, as, as, as explore this knowledge appropriately to be able to bring them out and bring them to the surface. So we will do a lot of awareness creation. We will have to create a um, strong research program. We have to create participatory plant breeding program for adaptation of this forgotten food. We need to promote collection and conservation of their genetic resources. We need to develop sustainable seed system. We need to do facilitation of better access to market and support short supply chain we need to encourage more advocacy and evidence-based policy change. We need to do introduction of knowledge on forgotten food into the teaching modules in our educational uh, program. And we need to work strongly to encourage um, advocacy and evidence-based policy 
sea change. And this, among others, are the things that are in the front burner. Like I mentioned, we have established forgotten, uh, forgotten food community of practice in Africa. And I think about 530 individuals are participating actively in this community of practice. We follow the due process in Africa and we open up the space for everyone that is interested in this community of practice to be part of it. Now, the central objective of this African community of practice is, is to foster the integration of forgotten food commodity into the mainstream food system in African countries. And we want to do this through research, knowledge generation and dissemination, technology development, advocacy for policy development, and we want to foster investment. Everyone in this com community of practice is aware of this um, goal. Now we have launched the community of practice where we discuss adequately what we want to do. And, and I love to use this table to illustrate um, the diversity of individuals and organizations that you, you find there. Largely, uh, the community of practice is made up of members from Africa and some Africa in, in the diaspora. And then uh, members of the public sector, so public sector actor, they are 418, while private sector actors are 118. So what we did is to use the, the um, competence, qualifications, and experience of these individuals to categorize them into three. You agree with me that um, discussing issues with 538 individuals is going to be a difficult thing. And so based on experience, we have the think tank component, which is the higher echelon of the community of practice. They are about 26. They have increased now to 40. Then we have this active community of practice, people who are practitioner day by day, but they don't have many years experience like the people in the think tank, they are about 170. Then we have the enthusiasts. Enthusiasts are just people that are interested in um, forgotten food. They are 401. So we have opened a dedicated D group platform for this community of practice and interaction is going on. We have um, following the interaction and new knowledge that is emerging. We have um, documented two series of, of knowledge generated from this stakeholders interaction. Now, um, there are some progress we have made outside establishing um, the community of practice. You know, the interest is high in Africa and the community of practice, of practice is beginning to um, enjoy uh, um, partnership interest. In fact, um, um, development partners have contacted us. For instance, the Grow Further Incorporated in the United Kingdom KTN in the UK, they have co contacted the community of practice to have um, to begin to contribute to what we want to do. They want us to establish research partnerships with them. And then, for instance, the Grow Further, um, we have asked the community of practice, those who are engaged in research, to submit a concept note, and this is being processed at the moment. Number two, um, FARA, with support from F FAO Africa, um, has, has established a project. And this is to commence initial identification and characterization of forgotten food in Africa. Largely, this particular action is going to use a lot of indigenous knowledge. Okay, we are going to explore the biodiversity that is existing in Africa. And then in December, we are going to commence this activity and we are going to carry along the community of practice. Let me say this, that the community of practice in Africa is going to be the first cohort of experts that we will engage to participate act actively in all the jointly identified action. And the last one is this awareness creation on the identified forgotten food. You know, um, we are going to begin to carry on this within this FAO um, little grant to run, to, to actually activate um, the action towards integration of forgotten food into mainstream in Africa. So I'm going to conclude by saying that the forgotten food issue constitutes the bedrock of the diversity in traditional and indigenous food system in Africa. And it is important to put knowledge together um, from, from, from traditional beliefs, cultural uses, and, and agronomic practices that are used in, in old times to ensure 
that we mainstream this into the current food system. Now, this information will be used for both product development and awareness raising. And it is, it is, it is important now for Africa to shape its food system to deliver safe, affordable, and nutritious food. In Africa, we consider it that time for action on forgotten food in Africa is now. And, and let me use this last statement to qualify it and I will close. Um, the food situation is further aggravated with climate change issue and COVID-19. COVID-19, likely Africans are not dying so much due to COVID-19, but COVID-19 has actually affected job. It has affected the income of the household. And so it, and it has affected many economies such that the purchasing power for food um, has gone down with, within the household. And so we need to find a way to, produce, to provide nutritious food that is affordable. I think I should stop on that note. Not, uh, Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation and for highlighting uh, the importance of the community of practices, which is really the, which are the legs on which now we're going to walk. Um, I'd like to pass on now just for a, for an outlook of where we are heading, uh, I would like to pass on the floor for a minute to uh, Hildegard, uh, just to look at the way forward, but uh, leaving time for a debate. Thank you, Alessandro, and thanks to all of you. It's fascinating to see what you have been doing in the meantime, uh, since we met last time when we launched the um, Global Manifesto. Uh, and how you have been bringing together all your members on the communities of practice and uh, devising the, about next steps. That's really impressive. I, I kept on writing down what you have been saying. The list is a long one, but very encouraging. And it's all in, in, the, in the global action plan, of course, that, uh, that Carlo was so kind to present. So that's a quick summary of the main points that I have heard. We need an inventory or inventories of forgotten foods. We need awareness raising. So much go much broader than we are here tonight together or today together. Um, we need um, a value chain approach or uh, a marketing approach so that we turn these initiatives into, uh, into businesses. We need to um, have a different look at capacity development. So it's not just scientific or uh, technical uh, expertise we need, but it's also the skills to be innovative and to turn things, to develop things further and turn uh, these initiatives into businesses. Um, we need to, um, and here I'm coming now to what we will be uh, here and stay with you to, to continue doing this collective effort. Uh, we need a common platform. Um, and uh, to, uh, we need to mobilize resources so that there is investment into these businesses and into uh, all the list of things that need to be done. We need advocacy to uh, have the right policies um, at uh, whatever level needed, country level. Um, so this is certainly what GFAR stands ready to continue doing. And I do hope we can continue in the same partnership with Bioversity and Crop for the Futures and others uh, to do that. Uh, we are definitely uh, committed to do that. Um, we will, um, and Syed said it in the very beginning, it's a long journey. Uh, we started with where we are coming from and uh, Irish uh, mentioned it's still a long way to go. So we are uh, in the middle of, of, of this uh, fascinating journey. We will stay with you. Uh, we will continue um, with uh, the support of Alessandro in, um, uh, who is coordinating this within GFAR uh, to stay and to keep on supporting you. Uh, we will always have a look um, and try to make sure as much as possible that the focus is always on the farmers, male and female farmers, smallholders, family farmers, working in and with and for forgotten foods. Um, and we would be happy to also support with the with seed money, we are not a donor, as you know, but we are happy to have some seed funding from our funders. Um, and the, the very first initiative we would be uh, happy to do is uh, in, in India together with AFA. But this is just one idea that uh, we have been discussing and we look very much forward to hearing from you, to be approached by you, to engage with you on more specific ideas, how to now implement this global plan of action. 
So with this, um, let's finally turn to the exchange. And I have seen in the chat that there are a couple of questions already. Uh, I saw one, for example, from Syed uh, to, um, to Wole uh, about uh, the, how farmers in Africa are involved. But I guess there are many more. And I leave it to Alessandro, if I may, to your able moderation to see whoever is asking, whoever else is asking for the floor so that we can work in uh, like a good collective action and not just listening to each other, but also having a chance to directly exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so let's try now to see what uh, are the opportunities that you have uh, identified to uh, move forward uh, with the implementation of the Global Plan of Action, which I think was uh, very well explained and illustrated in its diversity, but also in its coherence. So the floor is yours to suggest, uh, uh, I, I would like to underline this fact, so suggest opportunities for implementation. We are very interested in this. Thank you very much. Who wants to take the floor? I think uh, uh, there is a program that I know of biodiversity that is, could be a new opportunity coming up where we could frame uh, some of our actions, a program under the 1CG that Carlo might want to illustrate. Yeah, th thanks, Alessandro. Indeed, that is uh, that could be a good opportunity. Um, as probably many of you know, there is a, a reform of the CG, and we are moving into one CG, uh, and as part of it, and and actually, I think uh, also inspired by the process of the manifesto, I can say, uh, I've been um, developing. I'm, I'm leading the development of one of the 33 initiatives that uh, represent. Uh, uh, the, the the new structure of the 1CG, which is called Nature Positive Solutions. And there are, I think, a couple of uh, uh, outcomes and, 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 and the overarching structure that really talks to the manifesto. And so uh, as I represent the CGIR also here in this context, I think that that could be a, a good opportunity. It's probably the only uh, initiative where forgotten foods are mentioned and where there is a call for uh, the greater engagement uh, of, of the farmers and, and, and the research system to become more participatory. So welcome to join. Uh, we are operating in uh, four countries in, in, in Asia and, um, and Africa and plus Colombia and Latin America, Burkina Faso, Kenya, India, and Vietnam. And so hopefully that could be a good platform where we could collaborate and we could uh, have the CGIR contributing to the implementation of the action plan. Uh, thank you very much, Carlo. Are there other suggestions that we can discuss for uh, moving ahead uh, in the implementation? Uh, may I? Please. Yeah, good evening, good morning. I'm from India, Kerala. My name is Narayanan Unni. Welcome. I'm a farmer. Uh, I would like to just mention about uh, uh, for uh, forgotten food, which is or will or could definitely be a food for the future. This is a cereal, a rice. And the variety name is Navara, N-A-V-A-R-A. -A. It is a traditional variety of our state, Kerala, in India. And it has a history of more than 2,000 years of cultivation and use in certain parts of our state. And it has it's a medicinal rice in the sense it is used in traditional Ayurveda medicine of our place, Kerala which is an alternative medicine. And this rice is used in treatment of arthritis, paralysis, and polio in children, even mm. now effectively. And it's a nutritional rice in the sense it has seen to build immunity when we take in small quantities at least once in a day in our diet. And this is very <clears throat> important in this uh, pandemic times where immunity uh, resistance is, uh, I mean, very important, you know? So uh, I would, I mean, uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to participate in, for the invitation, especially to Dr. Revi, who has um, given me the, send me this invitation to participate. And 
thank you very much for uh, the time. And we have our website. It is www.navara.in where we have given details about this uh, specialty rice. It's not just rice. Uh, we are, I mean, since this uh, discussion has all been uh, with the forgotten foods, uh, but uh, rice, uh, staple, uh, rice is generally considered a staple, but it is not just rice. That is what uh, we would like, I would like to mention here. So uh, everyone, everybody is um, welcome to visit the website for more details. And in the gallery section, we have given photographs and uh, 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 documentaries done about uh, this product and about our work by European Union and Government of India, as well as a French agency uh, also. And uh, we have gone through all this. I mean, from the farmer side, we are farmers and the group of farmers have uh, this uh, 2000 year old rice variety was almost on the verge of extinction where a pure seed of this variety in our rice was not available starting from 1970s. So from, uh, we started to work on uh, purification of the seed from year 1999 onwards, and we could purify the seed in our farm. And for this, we were conferred the plant genome savior recognition by government of India Ministry of Agriculture. Then once we had the pure seed, and we adapted, since this is a medicine used as a medicine also, we adopted to uh, organic farming without the use of any chemical pesticides or fertilizers as per the advice of the doctors and vaidyas in the field of Ayurveda, this alternative medicine where it is used as a medicine. And uh, we had we are certified organic for India, EU and the USDA, as well as from the year 2004, we started to uh, register this as a geographical indication registration under our group of farmers, you know, and we could do this, register this as a geographic, in, this Navara rice as a geographical indication registration in the year 2007. And this is the first agriculture product in India to be registered as a GI under a farmer led initiative. So we have a mm -hmm. variety which has been I mean, uh, this unique uh, rice variety, which is a medicinal as well as a nutritional rice, which we were able to conserve and uh, purify the seed. We are we cultivated it organically. And now we have the intellectual property right of geographic indication registration. But we didn't, as farmers, we didn't leave, our, um, uh, leave it at that. Then as a next step, we started to value add this paddy into rice, rice flakes and uh, rice powder, rice flakes, uh, rice to be eaten as food uh, by I mean, people from all, all ages, starting from small babies, the rice powder can be a, baby health food, you know, for the babies. And the elderly can have rice and general people, I mean, general uh, 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 person, I mean, generally people can have it as a rice also. Then we had the rice flakes as a breakfast cereal, you nutritional know, breakfast cereal. So, and uh, rice uh, powder also as porridge or, uh, and it's a cosmetic also. It is seen that it enhances this ointment made out of this rice powder when applied on the face. It enhances the, um, uh, the beauty, you know, uh, the cosmetic effect is there. It enhances the beauty of the face, you know. So that is also there. So it is a medicinal rice, health rice, as well as a cosmetic also. So, and uh, we evaluated into rice these products and we addressed the market from the farmer's side with a brand name. Uh, and uh, we were able to successfully market this as a model. Side by side, the awareness about this traditional rice, unique rice was not there in the society itself because it was almost on the verge of extinction. So side by side, as discussed here, we tried to create awareness, starting by having a website with all these details. And then wherever we got an opportunity for a meeting or a conference or a workshop or a trade fair, we went, participated there, and we had the range of products of this particular rice variety. We explained wherever we are given some time for presentation, we made a presentation and explained the product, the uses and benefits and qualities. And um, so because as farmers, we didn't have uh, enough money, funds to uh, advertise massively in the newspaper or media or for a TV ad, you know. So these were the opportunities through which we could create awareness among the society. And we had been invited uh, for presentations in India, uh, outside India also, thanks to Apari again. Uh, we were invited for the first agrobiodiversity um, uh, conference in uh, Suwon. 
Thanks a lot. Sorry, we need to give space because we're about yeah, to close. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for giving us a very concrete example of the importance of uh, forgotten foods. Thank you very much. Yeah, one, la one last uh, sentence. Uh, we have been asked to write a book on this product, Navara Rice by TAS, Trust for Advancement in Agriculture Sciences. It is almost, it might be published in a month's time. So one, once it is there, uh, we would like to circulate this among uh, the, the GFAR and other members also as a model, I mean, a story, you know, success story. Yes, so please, please do send us uh, these <laughs> references you've made. Uh, to the GFAR address. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much for the time. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, Sayed? <clears throat> Mr. Nayan only illustrates the point I wanted to make that we need to collect all of this information in the global knowledge base so that we don't end up losing it, but at the same time we use it in a way that we can actually build actions upon. So I really we feel that it's more than inventories, it's more than experience, it's knowledge. And that knowledge base requires all of us to contribute and share intelligence information, data, uh, experience, all of the qualitative farmer knowledge into a global knowledge base that we can link with scientific data. And that would give us our baseline from which we can actually make concrete actions based on evidence. Thanks a lot, uh, Sayed uh, Ravi. Yeah, thank you, Alexander. Now we were talking about the implementation, how to move ahead. And of course, Dr. Narayanuni is one example we have in mind to how to move ahead with such people in the program. But we were in touch with the agency, a dialogue. And we have uh, Ms. Prerna Gurk from a dialogue who had a couple of interactions with us and where we could see how, like, it's good if she speaks a bit because she gave us a template of how to bring out the innovations by telling stories by the farmers and the villages and all. That is something which I believe everyone should be knowing. Uh, Ms. Prerna, can you, if you are listening to me. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Ravi. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I'm just saying yes. if you can highlight very briefly <laughs> about like how we were trying to see how we can do a project involving you. If you can very briefly highlight, it may be useful for everyone, not only Asia. Sure, um, um, Ravi and uh, Nitin also, I'm okay. also here. Nitin. Sure. Yes. Anyone of you yeah. can highlight, yeah. Yeah, so um, with our research that we are doing on the ground, uh, we see there is a valuable information out there with uh, communities with farmers and uh, 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 some of the uh, tribal population living in the forest. Um, we have collected many such uh, indigenous ingredients, uh, which has potential to become, uh, um, you know, a key ingredients for many recipes. It can become, uh, you know, it can uh, come into the mainstream and uh, we can revive them. Uh, so that is uh, what the outlook uh, uh, should be there for forgotten food, uh, primarily. And uh, there is an increased awareness about uh, uh, some of these spices and uh, these ingredients to be used uh, in the culinary experiences. I guess these are some of the usages that we are looking at. Uh, but holistically, what we believe in is that the process of innovation starts from uh, immersion, uh, you know, spending time with uh, farmers, spending time with uh, some of these experts who are, um, you know, who are out there in on the ground. So collecting that information is very crucial to start the innovation process, and then ranking them uh, as per the priority. Thank you very much, uh, Prerna. Uh, is there somebody else who wants to take the floor? We are about to close because we reached uh, uh, eight o'clock uh, in, uh, in, in Rome. And uh, I think we've been going through for two hours all the different aspects of the plan of action. And, but if there is somebody else who wants to contribute to the way forward, he or she is most welcome. 
Alessandro, there are some people who have their hands up. Can you see? I can't see them. No, that's why. Ah, okay. Carlo is, uh, is Carlo's hand is up. I see. Yeah. Thank you, Ildegar. I, I don't want to really to add. I think I've already put my contribution and, and, and the way forward. What I would like to do as uh, one of the organizer of the Agrobiodiversity Conference, uh, that was an exciting journey over the past four days, and that was an exciting way to close it. So that really was a great synthesis of what the Agrobiodiversity Conference was about. Uh, we touched upon, uh, you know, it was structured along three days, consumption, production, conservation. And the conversation today was really about the consumption, production, conservation. So it was a very nice summary of all what was discussed during the, the conference. So thank you all for your contribution. It was just great to close this way. Uh, thanks, Carlo. On, on these words, I think we'll have to close our side event. Um, I would like to say that uh, what I've heard is really reflecting the diversity of uh, opinions that we've managed to bring together. And I think there is a lot of coherence in uh, what we have in our hands. And uh, it's not only a coherence of ideas, it's a coherence of people. And when we were saying at the beginning that there is a movement, I think we have uh, really together created a movement and a dynamic which we cannot stop now. And uh, I think we need now to turn to proposals and maybe focus those proposals in areas where we are ready to start to implement something concrete. And in the days and weeks to come, we will uh, also prioritize among you know, the 10 areas that the uh, plan of action is uh, highlighting, we will prioritize which we can start with. And clearly everybody has agreed that, that awareness raising is the first thing to do, but we cannot limit ourselves to awareness raising. We need to also have activities um, that are also concretely moving ahead. What is already being done? I think that's something that we need to highlight. Work is already ongoing and we need to support it. So um, I would not close the meeting myself. Huh? I would not just give perhaps the last word uh, of uh, greetings and, and goodbye to the executive secretary of uh, GIFAR. And I thank you very much for uh, uh, being present, and it was an honor to uh, moderate this meeting. Please, Hildegard, if you can give a final word of goodbye. Yes, it's my real pleasure to conclude another important step in our journey, in your journey. Um, and uh, um, let me just say how fascinating it is uh, what you have all been doing in your regions, and that is uh, that we are happy to be part of this of this journey, but also of this joint. Uh, endeavor, which, uh, as I said, we call a collective action and we stand ready to continue doing. Uh, I hope you take the same excitement and uh, uh, energy and drive from this meeting as I do. Um, and uh, Alessandro already invited you to, to come and uh, be in touch with us so that we now can also take it further and support uh, implementation as much as uh, possible. Thanks uh, to, to all the the partners in this. Uh, I can't name all of you in, in, in person again, but it's really impressive. Uh, uh, thanks for those who attended uh, and take an interest in this uh, very important endeavor we are doing together. And, uh, and thanks again uh, with a special thanks to Carlo, not only for uh, doing this together with us uh, tonight and in this collective action, but also uh, for the whole Congress that brought us together here. Uh, it, I have been in other meetings of the Congress and it's really amazing what you have been doing over the couple of uh, days, the last days. So congratulations, good night to everybody. Good morning to uh, have a good sleep or wherever you are. Um, we took too much of your time, but there will be more opportunities I hope to uh, in, in, the, uh, in the immediate future, not somewhere. Uh, but uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much. And a big thank to, to Alessandro for taking us through the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, you. thank bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye, -bye. Goodbye.
Thank you very much.